Phantom Maniacs, welcome to the newest episode of the Needless Things Podcast, where we talk about toys, movies, music, and all manner of pop culture dorkery. I'm your host, Dave, and there's no way around it. Brace yourselves, sit down, hold on to something, possibly a, a stuffed, licensed character of some sort that you turn to for comfort in times of need. Ladies and gentlemen, this year... This is the year without a Dragon Con. I know it's heartbreaking, um, but we here at Needless Things are going to do our best over the coming weeks to provide you with Dragon Con-esque content that you may uh, take in however you like. If you'd like to, to sit down in a room in a slightly uncomfortable chair and place your media player of choice on a folding table in front of you and pretend that you're there in one of the host hotels uh, experiencing this live. That is sort of our intention. I mean, you don't have to do all that. But uh, the next few episodes, excluding our very special needless commentary for August, uh, the next few episodes are Dragon Con-centric and are meant to evoke the oral sensation, that's A-U-R-A-L, Sensation. Your what, whatever kinds of oral sensations you have during this are entirely up to you. Uh, whether it be the sting of a whiskey or the smooth burn of a vodka, uh, however you choose to enjoy them is up to you. But our intention was to recreate the atmosphere of a Dragon Con panel, and we have some very special episodes with topics that I mean, honestly, these all could have, might have, possibly would have been panels at this year's Dragon Con. Needless Things was absolutely going to have a presence again this year, and the next few weeks will present to you some of the panels that would have been if uh, fate weren't being so cruel, if mankind wasn't taking such an ass-whooping from whatever forces... Uh, intertwined to determine our destinies at the moment. Uh, So anyway, today's episode is a very special panel featuring myself and the members of the Execute Chapter 66 podcast, which is part of the Needless Things family. We sit down to talk about the Star Wars Legends, which is the old expanded universe. And it's exactly what you would expect from a panel about Star Wars Legends. It, we had a great time. We had a lot of fun. We had beverages while we were doing it, of course. Uh, actually, we, you know, you, you technically can't have beverages while you're doing panels, at least before 8 p.m. at Dragon Con. So this is almost like an enhanced panel uh, for your listening pleasure. Uh, but but anyway, it, it's I think you're going to enjoy these episodes we've got coming up. I've got a couple of special surprises planned, uh, and and this one again, you're, you're getting definitely a possible panel, and then there's there's more to come as well. Uh, we are working with the American Sci-Fi Classics track, of course to provide a couple of things that I don't know if I can announce yet, so I'm not going to. Uh, one of them's already in the can, and another one is coming up, and then, oh yeah, three. So there are, th- there are going to be three total of these special treats that you'll just have to wait and see. And there's another thing I'm working on, but it involves wrestlers, so I am going to go ahead and say it's probably not going to happen. I love wrestlers. I love wrestling. Uh, I, I cherish the friendships and relationships that I built during my time in independent wrestling here in Georgia. But it is, out of all of the people who are extremely difficult to get together in groups, uh, wrestlers tend to be even more difficult. Uh, and, And it's not that it's difficult to get together a group of wrestlers. It's difficult to get confirmation and to get the the wrestlers you want in a specific way, I guess. 
Anyway, that may or may not happen. And honestly, that one's, I'm more of a, hey, here's this and this, go over there to this person thing. I'm not directly coordinating it because I made it very, very clear up front that I just can't. Uh, so anyway, that's the thing that's going on. Uh, before we get into the episode, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, there's no news. I Seriously, uh, there was just no news this week. Um, before I get into the panel, I'm going to talk a little bit about Dragon Con. Uh, as many of you, I mean, any longtime listeners know our special relationship, uh, Needless Things special relationship with Dragon Con, and mine in particular, uh, I'm sitting here thumping my chest as though you can see it, although you might be able to hear it because I'm I'm still super intense from the DDP yoga workout that I completed about 20 minutes ago. So there's a lot of... Oh, yeah, oh. Um, I... Dragon Con is my vacation. I don't go hunting. I don't go fishing. I don't play golf. I don't do any of that. Uh, throughout the year, uh, my focus is my family, my job, uh, my my money job. Obviously, this is my focus, but I, I get nothing out of this aside from the adoration and refusal to comment and share that I get from you guys. Uh, but I, I love doing it. I love doing podcasts. I love... Uh, Re- interacting with and reviewing toys and stuff, uh, which is what led me to in 2012 being on my first Dragon Con panel. Now, my first actual Dragon Con might have been 93, might have been 96. I, over the years, I have nailed down a year for the purposes of a panel or a conversation or something else. Um, but we went to whatever preceded dragon con me and a friend of mine went and i I don't know what year it was i think it was called like the sci-fi fantasy fair i'm sure you listeners who know your atlanta nerd history better than i do um will know it might have been 92 and then whenever dragon con happened uh one sunday my friend and i got dropped off basically just to go in the dealer room for that this was i'm not even sure where it was it might have been the marriott uh I don't remember what well, the Hyatt was the Hyatt, the first dragon con hotel. Anyway, that one, whatever year it was, I was there, but I don't even necessarily count it because it wasn't, it wasn't significant to me. We were going to try and buy some nerd stuff. We didn't even know what else was going on at dragon con. Uh, and then in 2004, that's when I really, experienced dragon con for the first time thanks to my girlfriend at the time who is now my wife 2004 when did we we met in 2004 we got married in 2005 so yeah 2004 would have been the first year i went and actually understood that there was more to it than like a really expensive dealer room uh and then every year since 2004 i have gone uh, so, oh gosh, or was it 2003? Wait. Anyway, <laughs> sorry guys, I didn't know I was going to be talking about all of this. Uh, but 2012, I, well, 2008 or 9 is when I began going in earnest. I think 2009 was the first year that I got a room down there. And then 2012 was the first year that I was actually officially on a panel, thanks to uh, Mike Faber of the ESO Network. You should, I mean, you're probably already listening to many of the ESO podcasts, though I doubt all because there are so many of them. Uh, But uh, Mike Faber, who is a dear fellow who does so much to promote our culture, and I think at this point is, like, everybody knows him, but he's so omnipresent, I almost think he's underappreciated in a way uh but anyway he got me on to the 1982 panel for the dragon con american sci-fi classics track i had an absolutely amazing time uh and every year since then i have i've worked for dragon con essentially uh and i don't look at it as work even though it is a ton of work and more and more uh every year although no no more now that 
uh, we didn't do a game show last year. We did the Troublemaker premiere. Um, so that was 2019. 2018, when we did the Big Damn Game Show, uh, was probably the hardest I worked at Dragon Con. And it was still fantastic and life-changing and rewarding uh, ev- everything that I want out of Dragon Con. Uh, But I've had so many great experiences there, and I'll I'll talk about some of those. I'm not going to blow everything today in the intro. Uh, I'll share some of my favorite experiences over the coming weeks uh, for the the intros in the succeeding episodes. Uh, But that 1982 panel was fantastic. It exists out there somewhere. Uh, Somebody at one point had the audio, has the audio. It was posted as part of a podcast that I think doesn't exist anymore. If I can ever track it down, I will find a way to share it with you guys. Uh, it, it was it was great, and I had no preparation whatsoever. It was basically just, hey, do you want to be on this panel? Okay, and I went up and sat down and did a panel, because that's the kind of guy I am. So if I see a microphone, and somebody says, hey, Dave, or at the time, hey, Phantom, uh, do you want to get on a microphone? I'm going to say yes. I don't care what it's about. I will take that microphone and I will run with it and look let me toot my own horn for a minute here I'll probably be one of the most entertaining people to handle that microphone sorry I I just it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to do anything like that and uh, while I don't feel like I'm rusty I am jonesing to get back out there which you know it's the funny thing about the situation that the world has been in for the past few months I almost needed a forced break um, I wasn't burned out on the performing aspect, but I was very burned out on the coordinating aspect. It is exhausting, uh, doing the stuff that I do. I'll, I'll just wrap it up in a bow like that. Doing what I do is emotionally and mentally exhausting. Uh, and it's, it's a good kind of exhausting because it, it's, you get replenished in different ways. So I am, while I'm constantly being drained of creative energy, I'm also constantly being sort of topped off or or maybe not topped off, but like kept, kept it, uh, an eighth of a tank, maybe. And sometimes I get all the way up to three quarters of a tank, but dragon con is a time of year where I'm running at full turbo injectors, blasting, uh, just recycling that energy like crazy and, and throwing it back out, uh, which is which is what I want to do. I want to take in as much good energy as I can. I want to generate it. I want to I want to cause that good energy. I want to suck it in, and then I want to disperse it as much as possible, which is part of why uh, I, I bring people into my panels and try to get other people. It's it, just like Mike Faber. Um you know, he, he uses his powers for good. He wants to, to bring other people up. Uh, and uh, Mr. Bo Brown is the exact same way. Uh, well, maybe not the exact same way. I think he is more selfless than uh, myself or, or Director Faber. But it's that I want as much power as I can have, but I want it because I want other people to benefit. I want people to be happy and entertained. I want people... Uh, to be uh, able to have a venue to express their creativity and their talents and their things that they do. And that's why Dragon Con and I have such a symbiotic relationship now because that is that is a place where I, I've dug myself in and I've got a I've got my little spot and it's little. Don't make any mistake about it. Uh, you know, even if we did pack a 800 person ballroom out for a game show, my spot is a tiny, tiny little niche of Dragon Con, but I'm going to hang on to that spot, and I'm going to pack as many people into it as I can, and when they don't fit anymore, I'm going to get a bigger spot. And just, I, I just want to, like I said, recycle that positive energy. I feel like every time you, know, you bring it in, you give it back, and it's more, and you're actually, I know you can't uh, create energy, but I feel like that's what we do. Anyway, that's why I love Dragon Con. Uh... Like I said, every year since 2012, it's been a vital part of my year. It's my hunting and fishing and golfing and tennis and whatever else all rolled into one. Uh, it is the weekend where it's the weekend where I feel young, where I feel like anything is possible. Where um, and look, the rest of my life is 
well, yeah, I hate my day job. That's never going to change, but it pays the bills. Uh, but you know, I, I, I love my family. I love spending time with my family. Uh, I, we've got a great place we've made here. Like my life is pretty darn good, but Dragon Con is where the, for once in my life, I have the opportunity to work as hard as I can possibly work and at something that I love. Um, which I think is very special. It's certainly special to me because I wasn't brought up that that's how you do things, I guess. I don't know. Not to get into all that. So this year, no, there's not a Dragon Con, and it sucks. But let's all use this time to to relax, to balance our energies, to, to think about how once... Once this thing is passed, because it's going to pass and life will go on, and hopefully maybe we learn to all be a little bit better to each other in the meantime. Maybe having to, this forced separation will make us appreciate each other a little bit more once we can be together again. And next year's Dragon Con, man, think about that energy. Think about the first show you go back to. Think about the first just day at the park where you can hang out and barbecue with everyone just think about all this positive energy that we're all going to have bundled up inside and it's up to us to keep it positive it's up to us to look around and realize that the excitement we feel when we go back to that first musical concert or the or the 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 happiness the first time we can go back to a museum or or whatever the case may be it's up to us to embrace that positivity and hang on to it and recognize that it can be taken away from us sometimes but that while we've got it we need to enjoy it for everything it's worth and and isn't it better to make people feel positive and and to be in general a little kinder a little nicer a little more wonderful uh why can't we all feel like dragon con all the time why can't we Anyway, I didn't mean to go off on a whole philosophical thing. Next week, I'll talk about how drunk I get at Dragon Con or something like that. Uh, But anyway, it's time to get to the meat of the program. Ladies and gentlemen, Needless Things presents Execute Chapter 66, Star Wars Legends. For banter before the show even starts. Can my favorite thing be the Bad Batch, even though it hasn't come out yet? <laughs> <laughs> so excited. So oh, excited. it's going to be like G.I. Joe in Star Wars. and ugh. It already was. I know. It's just going to be a whole series of that, though. <laughs> Fine. All right. So, uh, hey, it looks hey, like it, if it is that, crossover, Dave. It, it looks like uh, <laughs> it looks like it's time to start, so everybody ready to get started? Yes. All right. All right. Uh, I am Dave West, the owner and operator of NeedlessThingsPodcast.com, uh, the Needless Things Podcast, and I am here today with the hosts of the Execute Chapter 66 Podcast, and we are going to talk about the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now, for many of us, when we say Star Wars Expanded Universe, we're talking about the pre-Disney stuff. We're talking about what is referred to now as Legends. Uh, that encompasses a lot of books, video games, uh, even toys and stuff. Uh, And we're just going to go through and talk about some of our favorite and not-so-favorite things from the old continuity that was or was not official, depending on what time of day it was. But before we get to that, we've got to go down to my left here. Uh, You guys, introduce yourselves and give us a piece of Star Wars uh, information that relates to you. Yes, I know you're not actually to my left. Uh, that's why don't you start. <laughs> yeah. pick, pick somebody. I said, Beth, why don't you start? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, you're sitting right next to me. How can you not hear me? So sorry. Uh, I've had too many fireball shots at Dragon Con, and I don't don't know where I am anymore. <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> uh, my name is Beth Van Dusen, and 
Uh, being put on the spot, I, I don't know a piece of Star Wars information that relates to me. Well, except favorite that book or whatever. My, my favorite book is Darth Plagueis, and my favorite cartoon is The Clone Wars, and my favorite video game is Rogue Squadron. And it just so happens that about a month ago, your podcast, Execute Chapter 66, recorded an episode about Darth Plagueis. Everybody and should I go think check it, that out. It's all of one of it's one of all of our favorite books. So uh, everybody, please go to needlessthingspodcast.com dot com and look for it. Our all favorite right. character is also Dash Rendar. <laughs> you mean Han Solo Yeesh. too? Yeah. So. Uh, well, sir, my name you is Spoke. You're uh, next. Sure. My name is Chad Shonk. I'm a screenwriter, a novelist, and I guess a podcaster. Um, uh, my bit of Star Wars trivia is I know more about Star Wars than you do, and. Um, <laughs> It's true. That, it's very uh, true. My favorite Star Wars novel is also uh, Darth Plagueis because it's real good. All right. My name is Ryan, also known as the head of research. Uh, let's see. My kind of off Star Wars thing, I have a somewhat obsession with Plu Koon, the most badass Jedi, <laughs> but not necessarily like his in canon or even EU things. It comes from a very detailed backstory and characterization we did in my apartment in college based off of the Phantom Menace video game poster, which we would write things about Plukoon around, and he was in charge of getting all the Jedi sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we uh, between us, we know a lot about Star Wars. As a matter of fact, I dare say we've possibly forgotten more about star wars than a lot of people know in their lives uh certainly i can attest to that but we're gonna kind of go back here and take a look at the expanded universe that was because a lot of what we see now coming from dave filoni coming from various projects that disney is doing are bits and pieces of that old expanded universe being brought forward and worked into the new disney continuity uh, and sometimes it's very, well, uh, to be honest, almost every time it's very rewarding because I feel like they're generally smart about how they do it. Uh, but to go back and look at this stuff in the context of the era that it originally happened, which would be, was it 93? Was that when the 91. first? 91. 91. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, 91. Although, really, you can go back further to uh, Splinter of the Mind's Eye. And even right. the the Marvel comics, uh, and the so, Han Solo, the Han Solo and Lando books. Yes, yes, absolutely. So there's a lot of stuff that Disney. I think it's wrong to say they ejected it, but they said we're not adhering to that, which is fair because you know to be honest, Lucas never really did either. He didn't contradict it if he if it was convenient not to basically. Uh but th you can see a lot about the time that this stuff was coming out just by going back and looking at it. And we're going to look at some of our favorite things today. And uh, I want to start down at the end uh, with Ryan. What is the first, uh, just one of your favorite things from the old EU oh, or something you find remarkable? That's perfect because I, I kind of wanted to start off the conversation with it. Um, you know, I had some mistake. I like Disney canon. I've enjoyed it. Um I like how they're tying things together in the story they're telling, but I think it's fair to say that the Disney canon feels very safe. There is nothing out there, too out there about it. And so my first note is, man, the EU is weird as hell. Like, you know, you look back to, like, yeah. Dark Times when that came out. You've got Clone Emperor and Luke turned to the dark side. And then there's Force Storms and what else? There's wormholes that are hyperspace wormholes. Don't and forget I really, the living planet. There was yeah. a living planet, too. Zona like, Masek it. It's in my notes. I don't yeah, know how it's yeah. pronounced, but it's in my notes. <laughs> That's the closest I've ever heard anybody get to it. <laughs> I just really miss sometimes how crazy the old EU was. Um, and, you know, we're talking about the timeline. It's weird because when you look back, the EU feels like this huge error and there's so much content. 
but there's really only about eight years between Heir to the Empire and the prequels coming out where they start reining things in. And so much crazy shit happens in those eight years. Yeah, I, I, know. I really miss how sort of strange and experimental mm-hmm. things were. You know, and, and people often look at the Marvel comics and are like, oh, they're crazy. Look at the Space Rabbit and all, you know, all the. Uh, a lot of weirdness in the comics, but really, there was... Everything totally felt like Star Wars, but it did feel like they were willing to take a lot more chances with the types of characters they introduced and some of the ideas that they put out there. Now, granted, again, going back to Dave Filoni, whose name I'm sure we'll mention a lot even though we're not talking necessarily about his works, but he has started to introduce uh, some more outlandish ideas that that aren't even pulled necessarily from Legends. Yeah, the World Between Worlds feels like a very old EU idea. And I think that's the most we've gotten out of it. And, you know, say what you will about the Yazin Vong, or however you say it. I've never been clear you say it. It's No one has. (laughs) But it made the unknown regions, like, really crazy. And for all Disney canon has done, we talk about the unknown regions a lot. But so far, you know, there's, like, a Sith planet, and other than that, the Chiss, but it's pretty normal. So no, there's that, there's that alien race they tried to scare us with in the Throne books. Um, well, the none, none of the us grist. know anything about the Grist. <laughs> no, no, no. Grist, first of all, who, how... who may basically be the uh, watered-down version of the Yuzan Vong. I, I actually looked them up to see how to spell Yuzambong, and it's in one of the websites, there's a just a slash mark, like a forward slash saying Yuzambong Grisk. Like, yeah. they're the same thing. Uh, the, I, I mean, they're definitely not the same thing, but having uh, spent a lot of time with the Thrawn books now, because I've had to restart a couple of times, uh... I have picked up that there are a lot of very similar elements, and it seems to me that they're a modernization of exactly. that concept. Uh, yeah, first it, of it, all, he, how he, dare you? Were... <laughs> I was gonna say, how dare you speak ill of Jackson, <laughs> <laughs> the giant rabbit? <laughs> oh. All right, he should, yeah, well, you know that's later in my things that should be canon list. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. And, and also, uh, I will say, though, the weirdness goes... You mentioned Splinter of the Mind's Eye. That's a weird-ass book. Mm-hmm. Like, it is, and, and I, I read it when I was a kid, and I forgot how weird it was. It's real weird, and the Han and, the Han and Chewie books are... It, because uh, when they were written, they were just thought of as like, oh, here's some characters from the sci-fi series. So they're just kind of these like pulpy sci-fi books that have no interest in canon or anything like that. They're just telling these adventures. And there's some weird shit in those books, too, because they were other authors being able to, you know, the more authors you bring in, the weirder stuff you're going to get, right? The more variety you're going to get. I don't remember exactly. What is a mind harp? Uh, It's something they have on Sharu. (laughs) Ryan? (laughs) <laughs> oh god, I don't know if I, I remember that I don't, one. I don't remember what it is. I don't, well, I don't either. And that's going to be one of the things about this is is we're going to do yeah. some reminiscing, but I, I got to tell you, it's been years since I've read a lot of this stuff. So, one, I don't totally remember all of the details of everything, and two, there may be a, a point of view or a perspective on something or information that came later that I'm not even aware of. Which is maybe some of of us intoxicated and we're just going to misremember. Well, and that's possible too. I'm sorry, I would never do that here at Dragon Con. No, no, never. (laughs) This is not the time nor the place. No. Uh, So yeah, I I agree. I I really enjoyed the craziness of the old EU, and you know, really at the time it didn't even seem like craziness because Star Wars didn't seem as well defined in a weird way. Well, they were defining it. I mean, right. it was in the process of being defined. Um, although I do agree with Ryan, I think Rebels took up a lot of, not a lot, but I think it, it did its good, not just the world between words, but the big space whales and I stuff. I was going like, to say, it, the hy- hypergalactic yeah. space whales, that's pretty damn yeah. weird. I think I think with Rebels, they took their, they bec- uh, because it was a much smaller story, I think they took their time to, you know, it was Mortis on, there's the, the, the Force stuff. The, the, the problem is it all involves the Force. Right. Like, every yeah, bit of there's it. There's nothing weird you know, than doesn't have to do with the force. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
Uh, all right, I am. Mm, okay, I'm gonna go next. Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bring out the big one yet. I'm gonna. Okay. I'm gonna keep it easy. I'm gonna mm-hmm. throw something out there that I think everybody can agree with. Uh-huh. And one of the elements that I truly miss a lot, and and I feel like could very easily be re- reintroduced, is the Jedi Master Kukruk. Uh, Which one's? If you don't know that name, it's because I pronounced it wrong, probably. Okay. Uh, it is K apostrophe K R U H K. He is from the Dark Horse comics. He's a whipped Jedi. Oh and yeah, 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 yeah. In the comics, he lived from 50 years before the Battle of Yavin all the way through the Legacy comics, which took place far in the future and and starred uh, Luke Skywalker's, I think, grandson, Cade? That's on my list. I'll talk about it. Uh, And then the later series starred Han's granddaughter, I think, too. They had two different Legacy series. So, he was a great character, uh... It's hard to put all of his appearances together because he actually was in a lot of Dark Horse's books because they connected everything. Like, it's interesting, within the old Star Wars canon, there is a Dark Horse canon where so many elements from their various different series and miniseries and everything else tied in together. You might see, for instance, Kakrook would show up in an un- a seemingly unrelated comic... Uh, Dark Times, like, after sort of his main story seemed to have been told, uh, it's very interesting how they took sort of their creations and used them uh, across time. And because Hasbro used to be a much more interesting company than they are now, I've got a figure of the guy. I was going to say, I remember that figure. Yes, they used to make figures that weren't just humans or droids. They made no, you have that aliens. Whole, you have that whole section on your shelf that's like a bunch of expanded universe yes. figures, and I get jealous of it over time. There's characters in there I had no idea they ever made figures of. It, it was it used to be incredible, and look, don't get me wrong, the modern toys look amazing, but they're so boring, you guys. They just are. I'm you sorry. don't want another Vader? <laughs> well, who doesn't want another Vader? Let's make let's give this one a lava glow. Let's do a throwback to that great Target exclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, but anyway, uh, I really really loved this character. Uh, he he was essentially a new Yoda, except he was way better than Yoda. Uh, he lived through the entire original trilogy, the prequel trilogy, and all the way through Dark Horse's expanded universe. And an interesting point about him is he is mentioned in the novelization of Revenge of the Sith, which makes me wonder, does that make him canon? No, Revenge of the Sith book is no longer canon. Oh, really? That's, like, specifically a thing? There are elements in it that throw it out of Disney canon. And I can't remember what they all are. I know we've talked about them. I would have to go back and look. But there are elements in the Revenge of the Sith book that knock it out of Disney canon. Oh, wow. That's that's unfortunate. But like I said, it doesn't rule him out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, he was just this great character who showed up all over the place. Uh, you know, at one point he, he was in hiding. And that's something I would like to address, and I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts about this. So, as not only the old expanded universe, but the new expanded universe as well has gone on. You know, we keep seeing that there were Jedi after order 66. And, you know, there's, there is a point of view of, well, they just keep finding Jedi all over the place. But to me, it's much more ridiculous to think that order 66 actually did exterminate the Jedi. Like that seems silly to me to think. Right. Well, and especially because you have so many Jedi that weren't generals or, you know, warriors in the Clone Wars. You know, you've got Jedi that are acting as military or like uh, liaisons to governments or meditating on planets. There's a whole thing about them going on basically sabbatical for a while to go learn places. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense that they would find them all. And there's a lot of good stories about Jedi being able to cut themselves off for the Force yes. so that Vader and them can't find them. And so if you're cut off from the Force and you're not using 
you know, your gifts anymore or whatever, eh, what do they really care? Like, you're not kicking up dust, dust, so whatever. You can hang out on a planet and be sad and try to communicate oh. with a master that will never answer. Oh. Coming soon on... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess canonically now uh, a lot of Jedi became Inquisitors, or at least some of the Jedi became Inquisitors. Some of them were turned. Some of them, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I we've talked about this, I think, before on our show about the idea. That d- does does that, however, diminish the importance of the Jedi that we follow? <laughs> you know, the idea that there's more of them out there. I think it's a little, it's a weird little corner that Lucas just kind of wrote himself into. You know, forty years ago, forty five years ago, where it was like, oh no, he destroyed all the Jedi, and it's like, oh well, I want to tell more stories about Jedi. You know, and it just. They just decided to forget that part of it, and and it makes a good story. It does beg the question: If they all got together, couldn't they take out the emperor? No, you don't I think, think so. Went, well, here's here's well, the if thing: Plo, If Plo Koon and Mace Windu couldn't do it, here's the well, thing you have to consider: is no, that what it comes down to is Jedi does not mean one singular thing. Uh, there are different kinds of Jedi, lots of different kinds of species and people and personalities are Jedi and once you introduce that kind of diversity into an organization especially after let's say 90% of the Jedi were wiped out then it's going to be hard to get people on the same page with this the a shared idea of the way to go forward and this is something that the old EU addressed uh, a couple of different times in, in various points of, of Jedi history, not just in the New Jedi Order, but in some of the Old Republic stuff as well, was that being a Jedi did not mean, mean that everybody thought the same way. Uh-huh. No, and it went through, and the idea of the Jedi Order went through, cha- it went through changes, it went through upheavals, it went through, you know, reformations almost. Yeah, um, yes. It evolved over time, and part of that was that we had many, many years of, of especially Dark Horse comics of Jedi, and then Lucas came out with Phantom Menace, or actually, actually Lucas came out with Attack of the Clones and said, uh, "Jedi don't fuck." And yeah. all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, all these stories we have of these Jedi families in the past are like, um, they're just different now. <laughs> he, had, he had never told us Jedi were celibate, especially since you know Anakin had a kid. We didn't know that at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had I had long on my list. Uh, I just I did have uh, Dark Horse is one of the things I did have the idea that, like you said, the Dark Horse kind of continuity. Well, let's elaborate on that then. Yeah, I mean, it just like you said. It listen, I, I think the Marvel books are probably on the the new Marvel books are on balance better written, um, and and I think the art is way better in the in the Marvel books. Um, but there was something, you know, to, kind of to go to Ryan's point as well, there was something really pulpy fun about the Dark Horse books. Um, and uh, they, you know, yeah, they were licensed, you know, probably second tier type books. But there were some really cool stories. The Tales of the Jedi uh, series is one of my favorites um, that told the, that took place, take place. And, they, you know, they're big and epic. That Tales of the Jedi took place like 4,000 years before... Mm-hmm. Um, before A New Hope. And and they just, I don't know, they created this world and, and names that would come up in that series would come up in Legacy or would come up in other series in between. Like you said, there was a very strong continuity specifically within, I don't, uh, I, I'm sad, I, I, I don't like that I don't know this, but I don't know who the editor was for the Star Wars group at Dark Horse at the time. But they did a really good job of, you know, spreading these characters out over years. And yeah, and they went further in the future than any Star Wars storyteller ever has. That legacy is 125 years past Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Yeah, they go... That's the furthest anybody ever went. They, they went the furthest back and the furthest forward. Well, one of my favorite things that Dark Horse did, and this, this was exact... This is a great example of the type of genre-bending stuff that they would do, is uh, Agent of the Empire. Did any of you guys read that? Oh yeah, it's basically James Bond in Star Wars. Yeah, but with an imperial right guy. It's yeah. it's fantastic, uh, and and it's that kind of stuff. Dark Horse would take you know these different ideas, concepts, genres, and 
basically slap a Star Wars skin on them, which, you know, people tend to say that sort of thing in a derisive manner, but for me, like, that's cool because that can be really good Star Wars storytelling. That can be really good storytelling for anything. No, I mean, and the other thing, too, to give Dark Horse credit, like, just like in 91, when I went to a bookstore and saw Heir to the Empire on the shelf and lost my shit, in 92, I went into my comic book store, and there was a new Star Wars comic called Dark Empire. Yes. And while some people have soured on Dark Empire over time, and maybe they didn't like the story, whatever, it was mind-blowing when it came out. The art was gritty and realistic, but also still really cool, and the storyline was... I don't know. I just remember it being, you know, they brought Boba Fett back. I just remember Dark Empire being a really big deal and that Star Wars comics up until then, you know, in the Marvel books, you can have affection for them, but they weren't good. Mm -hmm. And so for for me to read truly probably the first great Star Wars comic I'd ever read. Well, it made me uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Dark Dark Empire was fucked up. I don't think people like really remember now as much like that scene where Luke bowed to the emperor yeah. and gave into the dark side was huge i mean yeah. it was pre you know big fan boards and internet and all that but people were pissed and it, but it also it, had cool new ships yeah and, and stuff like the e-wing fighter and the was it the, the howl runner or something like that and like they had it had uh, uh it, i don't know everybody showed up in it it said Boba showed up. It, it's where we got Nar Shada for the first time. They created Nar Shada for that comic. Um, yeah, I just see they they started all that, and then I know some people are down on it. I didn't mind Crimson Empire. I thought that was okay. Um, but uh, you know, the books were hit or miss. But all in all, they they did tell one big story, um, and they used a lot of the same writers too. Yeah, whoever was overseeing. I guess I would imagine there had to be a team between Del Rey and Dark Horse because yeah. whoever was overseeing that was really, really tight on the continuity, on the characters, because there there are places where you can tell a writer might have been like, hey, do we do we already have a character that's this that we've used? And they insert something, uh, because going back to Kukrook, he appeared in some of Del Rey's novelizations as well. Or novels, not novelizations, but he okay. was he was in Labyrinth of Evil uh, by the awesome James Lucino, Lucino, Luc- Lucino, yes. Lucino, okay, yeah. author of Darth Plagueis. Yes, uh, <laughs> one of one of the great uh, Star Wars fiction writers, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but yeah, there there's so much cross pollinization between Del Rey and Dark Horse that really made it all feel important and real. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Beth, what uh, what's what's your first fun thing from the EU that you miss? Well, since I was going to start with something else, but since you just brought it up, I would like to talk about something else by James Lucino, and that is Vader uh, in Dark Lord: The Rise of Darth Vader. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I, I'm just re-listening to the audiobook of it, and what I hate about it is that it's it's been cut, like a lot of the old EU books have been cut down, so it's not the oh, full really? book. Oh, really? Yeah. That's a weird. lot of the old EU books have been edited. Now, and is that the one that's sort of a sequel to Labyrinth of Evil? It's part three. Labyrinth of Evil is part one, and then Matthew Stover's Revenge of the Sith novelization is part two. And then oh okay okay so so it was it was a it was a trilogy but with Revenge of the Sith in the middle oh they Matthew sold... Stover I think yeah Stover, Stover wrote the the adaptation he wrote um I believe he's the one that wrote the book that was almost entirely Vergier torturing Jason Solo right yeah I don't remember he, I, he wrote lots. I hated it first but then like the second time I read it I was like this is freaking amazing. So I don't remember Dark Lord that much, Beth. What What's going on in Dark Lord? So- uh, well, there are Jedi who escape Order 66. And remember, this is back in the days before they had chips. There are no chips. It was just Sheev got on the phone and, and called him up and said, hey, go kill the Jedi. And they all went and did it, except for a few clones 
who said, mm, nah, we like our Jedi, we're not going to kill them, or we want to know who the Order's coming from. Or So there were clones who had questions and didn't kill the Jedi that they were working with. So several Jedi are on the loose, and for some reason, and I don't know why they wrote it this way, but she knows all about Obi-Wan and Yoda being alive, mm-hmm. and yet does not care. But what I really, really like about this book, and what I don't feel like has been touched on in other books that I've read in in as effective a way as in this book, is what Vader is actually going through. Because he's kind of in that, I'm not Anakin, but I'm not quite Darth Vader yet. Because he still throws like a couple hissy fits and like force throws some droids around because she didn't build me the ship I wanted and and the Jedi beat me up and I'm all upset about it and he's he's still having a lot of Anakin feelings. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do remember that though. I do what I do remember about that book is I thought it did a pretty good job of putting us in his in his brain and coming up with what you know, what he what what could have been his thoughts and, and point of view during this period. I thought I thought they actually did a pretty good job of that. Yeah, and now that you've You don't get inside Vader that much. Now that you've pointed that out I do, because I, I read this one years ago, and I do remember it was the only thing that made me buy the transition from Anakin to Vader. Exactly, because he goes, otherwise he goes from being mopey bitch to, like, badass, scary guy, and there's just nothing in between. But this gives you a good in-between, because he's still he's still mad, and he's still angry, and he's still got power, but he's not quite out of being Anakin yet. So he's still he's, kind of a little bitch. I think he's now, still regret, regretful too, right? He's yeah. still he's still wrestling with what he's done and what his choice, what his choice, and where it's led him. And I'm trying to remember. No, it's not. It's not Dark Lord, the one where he starts healing himself, is it? No, in this one, he's he's not even built himself like any kind of a hyperbaric chamber or anything. Oh, he's, that's right. He's still having to get his his dead flesh cut away from him because he's still got flesh that's going necrotic on him, and and he's just feeling trapped and very confined and claustrophobic in his suit, and the suit it's all screwed up and it doesn't work right, and he's kind of a mess. So you can kind of see where he's coming from. Is it totally fucked up that I'm real into the like how does Vader keep his flesh together type stuff, like all the <laughs> under, under under the helmet stuff? Like I want to know all that. Oh, that's no, fascinating. I, I find to it me, super though. interesting. No, it is. I mean, it's and and it's been explained, you know, prior even to the Disney stuff. I think we've had conversations about this sort of thing. Is that the reason Vader isn't as powerful as Anakin Skywalker could and should be? is that he has to expend a certain amount of his force power, for lack of a better word, keeping his shit together, keeping his pain under control, um, and and just basically making himself function. Like, if he wasn't as powerful a force user as he is, then this, this would not work. This Vader situation would not work. And on top of that, that all of that was planned by the Emperor to keep him in check. Well, and this book does a good job of, of covering all that because it is, he's, he talks about, you know, I have to use the Force just to be able to take a step because he feels like he's being held down by the suit. And he says, if I didn't, if I didn't have the Force, I wouldn't be able to move in this thing. So he is expending power just to be able to walk around. And I know a lot of that is being apologetic for why he doesn't move like the other Jedi. Why he didn't do we... flips and stuff when fighting yeah. Obi-Wan. Well, I mean, Obi-Wan wasn't putting up much of a fight <laughs> either. But it's it's really interesting to see into Vader's mind in a way that we don't get to very often, but also to see the, the kind of transition from Anakin to Vader. But he's still a whiny bitch in this one, so you get to see a lot of that. <laughs> In case you didn't know, Beth thinks Anakin is a whiny bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. We we kind of all do. I mean, Padme is pretty hot. I'd be probably a whiny bitch too. <laughs> I don't. I don't blame Hayden Christensen. No. <laughs> uh, all right. I am going to throw another one out there. We're going to change our order up a little bit. 
uh, because we're we're getting kind of to the midpoint, and I think it's time to throw out some controversy. Uh oh. And it's Which already happened? been mentioned, but we're going to double down on it now. I loved the Yuzen Vong. You were going to say that. <laughs> loved them. Uh, I was kind of away from Star Wars a little bit. I did not read Vector Prime when it came out. Uh, I didn't pick it up until it was in paperback, maybe even a couple of years after New Jedi Order had gotten underway. And I was absolutely just sucked in. Uh, the idea, and, and look, I understand all of the flaws with the Vong, and yes, I know that's insulting to them to refer to them that way, but too bad! It's all right. I apologize to any of our Yuzen Vong listeners. <laughs> Yes. Uh, anybody in the audience uh, using Vong? No? Okay, good. We'll keep going. Yeah. Uh, this concept was so cool to me at the time of this in this this extra galactic threat. Because at this point, what else are you going to do? They've done so many different super weapons. They've done so much political intrigue. You know, there, there weren't a lot of avenues left to really give reasons why this new republic would fail. And I thought this was a really cool way, because the Unknown Regions had been mentioned, but they'd never really done a whole lot with them. Uh, And just this insidious invading force that started in such a great way with Naminor having, like, they're already there. That's what was so messed up about it in the beginning. It's not like, uh, you know, they had time to prepare. By the time you get done with the first book, you realize they're they're here. They're among us. And it really felt like a threat. And, of course, at the time, there was a lot of controversy about Chewbacca dying. You know, little did we know, 20 years later, or however long... We'd see everybody freaking die on screen in front of our eyes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Chewbacca died, and I thought it was done in, you know, it, it wasn't this massive, oh, he jumped in front of a, you know, a blaster bolt and saved Han. He died saving people, which I thought was so big and so important because that's Chewbacca's story is he was saved by Han and now, you know, it's it's almost a full circle type of thing. But the Vong just were this horrific menace. And a, as a concept, as a, as a threat to the characters that we've been following for so long, I really dug everything about them. They, they were, the way the authors wrote about them was so weird and alien and unlike anything that we had seen in Star Wars... I feel like those early books were so successful at making them. Uh, again, I you know I mentioned it, Dark Empire. It was uncomfortable when Luke was following the path of the dark side, and this again made Star Wars uncomfortable, which was interesting to me. I, I will admit that they are far more interesting than the Grisk because the Grisk <laughs> are just some kind of amorphous threat that they could be out there and we don't know what they're doing but uh, Yu Zan Vong at least were kind of they were creepy and they were a real visible threat well and they ran the gamut from being sort of puppet masters in the shadows to horrifying monsters in your face and I think that was part of the success Mm -hmm. okay All right. right, right. so I, I don't I don't have a, a hatred for the Vong. Um, the New Jedi Order is not my favorite series. I'll, I'll admit that when it started, I was kind of only half rating Star Wars books, so I wasn't paying attention as much through the first couple. It was just so damn long. It was so damn long, and I get what they're going for, and I agree with it theoretically, but I was so ready for it to be over like halfway through, and um, and that's my biggest problem with that whole. New Jedi Order era is it, the story. You know, it, I, I feel like if they cut it in half, 
and, and condensed some of the stuff and not given us so many books that felt like they were treading water because there were quite a few, um, I, I would have much better memories of that time period. Uh, so so I, I have nothing against the Vong. I like the idea of a, an extra uh, galactic threat. Were, were they the most interesting to me? Not really, but they were fine. Um, they were enough different from the Sith that they made them interesting. Um, and it did lead to some cool stuff, and there were, were some cool things. I had the death of Chewbacca in my kind of honorable mentions list. And, but uh, I, just, I just felt like this series just went on way too long. <laughs> and, and I agree with you, it did. It, yeah, it did. really yeah. it went on too long. And a, as much as I appreciated how dire things got, it did get too dark. Um, yeah. I, I felt like the death of Anakin Solo was a tipping point for me. Like, that was too much. Yeah, and that was Lucas's call. Yeah, I, uh... No, I didn't know that. Really? Uh, Lu- because he didn't, uh, he thought he, he didn't like the idea of another character named Anakin out there when he was releasing the prequels. Mm-hmm. Wow, that is absolutely ridiculous. It is, but yeah, the idea is he didn't want, like, this pop character out there that had, um... Actually, since we're on that, can I go next? Yeah, absolutely. Because mine's, mine's totally related. Yeah. Um, because my first point was um, before Ben Solo, and even before Ben Skywalker, there were the Solo children. And um, uh, so what I wanted to bring up was was those characters. There were the Solo children. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but but Jason, Jaina, and, uh, and and baby Anakin. Um, the uh, I, I like the story of Kylo Ren quite a bit. I like Ben Solo, but... Ever since Heir to the Empire, again, the big boom, you know, the, the, the big bang for um, the EU, was, um, you know, one of the things in that book was that Han and Leia had kids. And, uh, for, and, and I know that I was in high school then, freshman or whatever, and after I read Heir to the Empire, one of the first things I did was I wrote a short story about them as teenagers. Because I was like, this is going to be awesome. They're, we're going to hear about them. And... You can have differing opinions on the characters as you went through time, but we watched them grow up. They were they were they were you know smaller characters in the early books when they were younger. Then there was the Young Jedi Knight series of um, of children's books of young reader books, and then they got folded into the bigger to the bigger canon. And as the stories continued further in the future, they became bigger and bigger parts. And instead of um, kind of the it necessarily so the handoff the quick handoff to Ray that we see in the modern movies because it's just movies it took it was a long time where by the time you got to the the, the last books Jaina was kind of the hero and and, and successfully so yes as, yeah, because they took their time as a reader i did not mind that these new characters were coming to the forefront because well, we saw them as fucking earned. kids. And yeah, we, we saw had, them as kids. We had time to get to know them. You know, and, and you know, and, and they, 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 they did a good job. I liked the idea that Jason and Gina were twins. Um, Jason was what he was good with animals, right? Was that his thing? Yes. I think. Uh-huh. And yeah. then Jaina had her, her dad's Yeah, and her dad's flying skills too. Um and Anakin was, I think, a tinkerer, right? Uh-huh. Sure, I remember, mm-hmm. Or he was just a hothead, I don't remember. But you know, and yes, eventually they kinda they, they had Jaden, uh, Jason turned to the uh, dark side and become a Sith Lord, and eh, you know that stuff. I can take or leave. I'm not a huge fan of that storyline, but it's fine. But um, but just the idea that we, I don't know. I miss those characters. I miss Jaina especially, the Sword of the Jedi. Uh, Jaina was awesome, and they just, um, which to be fair, she was the only one left um, yeah. at the end. <laughs> um, and, and that always struck me as super tragic. The idea that Han and Leia fought so hard to watch their children die and them outlive them was a little fucked up and dark, like you're saying, with Anakin dying. Yeah, it was. But, it was. It was too much. The the Jason and Anakin both w- was too much. Yeah, yeah, and and so I don't know. I it just it's the first thing I wrote down when you said come up with things from the EU was I was just the solo children. I think we don't get them enough credit. And a special shout out, of course, to um, Ben Skywalker, who was also becoming a really cool character, uh, Luke's son. Um, yes, he, yes, absolutely. He, he was a cool character, and uh, and yeah. So I kind of missed that. 
you know, uh, growing, you know, seeing them as kids and then kind of growing into this awkward phase where in these children's books and yeah, we watched them grow up and, and it was fulfilling to see them become heroes before, of course, they became villains. But um, yeah, so the solo children. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, well, uh, Ryan and, and Beth, any thoughts about the solo kids? I, I agree with you guys completely. Actually, I thought they were great characters. I don't, I, I actually don't have anything to add that you guys haven't already said. I've got a Jane action figure. I need her twin. I have. <laughs> Help me out, Hasbro. I have two Jaina action figures because they actually they released Jason and Jaina in the old three point seven five inch scale, uh, and I've got both of those. Yeah, I've got the six inch Jaina, but which is great. It's cool. She's in her flight suit, which yeah. which indicates it's towards the end well, of the old EU. And she ended up marrying Baron Fell's son. Jagged Fell. Not, jagged, it kind of Which, became... Jagged? Like the, really? What? Yeah, well, you know. Eh. And he kind of, and she kind of became co-emperor of the galaxy in a way. Like, it was... Uh, Empress, like, it was just weird. It ended up it ended up almost Game of Thronesy, where it was these big families marrying each other, you know, yeah. and sharing power. It got really interesting. I was a fan of the Fell Empire, though. Yeah. I liked that whole thing that carried into Legacy and all that mess. Like, I thought it was a really cool storyline. Yeah. Well, and that was another cool thing about the era that we're talking about is they didn't forget the the politics, I guess, of the galaxy. Like, there were always, you know, a lot of the stories maybe were about Han Solo's evil brother or whatever, but they also always kept an eye towards the politics of the galaxy, and I thought that was very interesting as well. If we're talking about EU, should we refer to him as Prince Solo? Yes, yes. <laughs> Never forget. Thra- what, Thraken Soul Solo, wasn't that his? Thraken, Thraken Sal Solo was yeah. his uncle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, Sol- yes, his uncle. I, let's say this, I kind of like Han's new origin better. <laughs> I, I kind of do. Like, uh, uh, I'll give him that. All right, Ryan, uh, what is your next topic? I think one of the things I miss about the old EU, and it, it comes across in all of the books I'm reading right now, is I miss the Empire still being a badass after Return of the Jedi. Like, yes. New Disney canon, you've got a couple people that are kind of holding it together, but they're falling apart real quick. And there's never any, like shit they may come back and take it all off and that off you know force awakens was coming back so they couldn't do that but i mean the empire comes back strong whether it's thrawn or the clone emperor or the katana fleet or any of it they just don't roll over um and i kind of miss that from the empire because it doesn't make a lot of sense especially if you view that the empire isn't another organization that took over the galaxy but rather they're just a continuation a rebranding of the republic you know it doesn't make sense they would just roll over and go i miss that old military might of the empire yes and well and not just that but that transitioning you know we got thrawn and then eventually Pelion and the imperial remnant and like again the politics the cool transitions uh, of of power and and of how things moved around, not just amongst these characters that we like so much, but in the world that they or the galaxy that they inhabited, it felt it, so much bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, characters like Yassard and um, uh, uh, Dala, right? Yes, Dala. Yes, like you had you had some formidable. I mean, yeah, the years after were spent. Was it? Oh God, what was the warlord's name that Han? Zing. Zim, Zim the pirate? Zim, yeah. Zim, Zim or whatever he was. Like this, There were years Zinch. and years of years Zinch. of them of them fighting these warlords out there, you know, that, that the Empire had shattered into pieces, but they were still formidable pieces. Well, they've got and, moths everywhere, all across the galaxy, just grabbing whatever power they can. Plus so, it gave us the liberation of Coruscant in the Rogue Squadron novels, oh, which was awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, which and I I hate that I didn't put them in here, but all of the Rogue Squadron and uh, Wraith Wraith Squadron stuff is some of the very very best 
of the old EU. I think. Whether it was the comics, the video games, um, the novels, all of it. uh, Like, Wedge has been so poorly underutilized in everything, really, since Disney took over. Because he... I mean, Wedge was one of my favorite... Wedge and Corrin Horn and, like, all of these great pilots that got so much characterizations. Yes, Tycho Selchu! Now, hold on, Dave. Let me tell you about these books called Aftermath. (laughs) Oh, stop with the Aftermath. (laughs) Jesus. Are you going to be telling me about them in the present tense? If Beth will ever uh, decide those books. I can't. Ryan is telling Dave about the Aftermath novels. Dave is rolling his eyes as Ryan talks. (laughs) Then Chad jumps in with a a clever non sequitur to divert the conversation elsewhere. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i got nothing, See? I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I, uh, I i he was he's on um he's on rebels like they show him a young wedge on rebels which has been cool um i like that but yeah you're right i mean this idea of rogue squadron as a um this amazing special forces team that that stayed together from basically off on with Wedge in charge, that that idea kind of went out the window, right? There's no in the new canon. There really is no Rogue Squadron. No, and it's no, like, no, gone. Yeah, yeah. They reappropriated the phrase for Rogue One in a way, and then like now we have Alphabet Squadron, which is fine. But yeah, no, they they really kind of. I think there's still room for it to be in there. Sure, I think there is. They just haven't. They've just kind of ignored that that era and yeah those characters and yeah i loved i loved Tycho, who was an imperial or he was captured by the imperials and they thought he could still be an imperial or whatever like no one ever trusted Tycho except for wedge um and and by the way almost every major character or almost every character we've mentioned by name during this conversation i have a figure of on my shelves because hasbro yeah. used to be a much more interesting company than they are now <laughs> so, yeah. so you're saying hasbro's not interesting now i'm saying hasbro is not serving the Star Wars license very well right now. I would to say this as a Magic the Gathering player, uh, Hasbro is fucking up all over the place. <laughs> as Hasbro's, oh, ki- no. Hasbro's killing. Hasbro's killing Magic. Oh and there's, no! There's some peak nerd when we're diverting to the Magic the Gathering offshoot <laughs> on the EU <laughs> Star Saying, Wars podcast. Yeah, if, if I have anybody, a lot of. Yep. That's that's a road I can't go down, Chad. Hasbro gets Hasbro gets a lot of my money, and uh, <laughs> but it's not through toys, and uh, they're fucking up right now. If anybody wants to question our nerd cred, yep. uh, <laughs> just take a look at that Magic the Gathering reference that got dropped. Yep. All right, uh, yep. we, we got to move on. Uh, Beth, what is your next uh, selection? I think that I will change mediums, and I will choose the original. Clone Wars cartoon for my next thing that I really liked. Okay. Yeah. The one that is not canon, but well, it can't be, but it it could be sort of if they change something. I I would say no. I know. Go ahead, Schweck. Yeah, they've said no, that it's not. I know it's not, but the origin of Anakin's star is no longer in canon. It's it's gorgeous, and for those okay. of you who have not seen it, it's by uh, is it Gen Gendi 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 Tartakovsky Tartakovsky is that right? Um, he did Samurai Jack. He did um, Dexter's Laboratory, but Samurai Jack is the thing that I appreciate him for because it's gorgeous. He took that same style and brought it into Star Wars, and it's beautiful. And the the episode that really stuck with me, that made me love it, was when they went to Nelvon and, and liberated all the slaves who'd been mutated, and Anakin has a vision of, of what's going to happen to him. Uh-huh. And it's just gorgeous, and there's very little talking in it, and that was one of the things I liked about it, was because it wasn't just a bunch of people talking at each other. It was very, very reminiscent of Samurai Jack. So if you like Samurai Jack at all and like Star Wars, go back and watch the original Clone Wars cartoons because they were fantastic. And, and you made General Grievous a total badass. Oh, yeah. 
he was fantastic. And they bring in a lot of characters like Mace Windu and, and Kit Fisto. And... Shirtless, underwater <laughs> Kit Fisto. <laughs> yeah! Which, by That's the way, I also have a figure of. Good God, man. <laughs> All right, um, I liked that show, but I hated that they were like two minute long, two minutes long. That really bummed me uh, out. Well, yeah, but if you get, I hate, you I the hated DVDs, it. Like they put it, they put it all together. Yeah, I got I the DVD, so I watched them all at yeah, once. Yeah. I watched when it, aired, when it aired. Out. I found it, I found it so unsatisfying when it aired. I was, it annoyed the shit out of me because of two because of the two minute thing. No, but, I, I watched yeah, them yeah, as they came later. out, but then I got the DVDs so that I could enjoy the. Full experience and yeah. what was that guy's I, name? Dirge, right? Dirge. Uh, oh, yeah, wow. Dirge. He was the main villain of it, and he had a some kind of souped-up swoop bike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they really built him up, and then he just went away. Well, that's okay. Yeah, well, there are things speak. from that. I feel like we could we could still bring some of that into canon, but really, it was just so pretty, and it was so nice to look at, and it was. I honestly, I don't feel like there's anything about it I didn't like. Even the parts that were kind of slow weren't that slow. Well, that's also but, where Asajj Ventress came from, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and she has become canon. So yes. obviously, there are more things that we can bring in. An excellent in- Plukoon representation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, mean, I don't we, how, how he's objectified, but you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've we've got to start wrapping up now, so it is time to talk about things that we did not care for. Oh, uh, wait. Before we go to that, how have we missed the most important EU thing? We haven't talked yes, about Mar- Mary Jade. Well, that was going to be one of my things, but Dave is only giving us two. <laughs> oh, well, we got only so much time here in front of this live audience. <laughs> oh, you got to at least mention Mary Jane. We have to mention her. We do have to mention her because she's uh, possibly, if there was one character yeah. that people could popularly vote into modern canon, it would be her. Yep, she's the whole. The like, only thing is, it would suck because it would turn out that like she and Luke were married for three months and then got divorced because he was such a sad <laughs> sack, and then she went and like killed herself or something. I don't know. I don't know what they would have come up with. Timothy Zahn told me that he had multiple, multiple ways in his head how to bring her into the modern canon. Uh-huh. He didn't tell me what they were, because I guess he's, <laughs> he's hanging on to them because he wants to use them. But she he didn't. said... He had many ways to bring her in. She and he didn't. said at DragonCon, he has pitched Disney on a book to bring her in. She and doesn't then, have to be Luke's wife, though. No, no. So, well, she yeah, can't that's be. That's the thing. I mean, she, she can't can be. be. He obviously yeah. can't be. I love the idea so. of the Emperor's Hand. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. not only is that a great idea, it's almost like you can't not have an Emperor's Hand and then beyond that, later on when she finds out she's not the only Emperor's Hand, like, there's so much great, again, that political intrigue that I love so much that I don't know that we're getting as in quite the same way now. I, I, I want to see that stuff. Yeah. yeah, but if you want to watch the low-level Imperial staffers go about their business, the new canon is for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's something I want. <laughs> Just saying it's something they've been doing a little bit of that I'm not a fan of. Um, <laughs> all right. So okay. we, we Mary Jade, obviously, we all love her. She was great. She was awesome. Uh, maybe there was a bit of, of Mary, Mary Sue about Mary Jade, but I don't care because she was great. Well, by, I mean, she trained Jaina for a while. Um, she became a real badass, and then she got murdered by her nephew. Which okay. was devastating. By the way, that was rough. That was rough. Yeah. It's a tale as old as time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, Chad, start us off with something that oh, stinks shit. about the old EU. Something that stinks. Well, I mean, there's definitely the Marvel comics. Oh come on! There's the Marvel comics. Come no, on. I know, I know. I'm stalling because I'm trying to come up with something. I wrote down well, shit that I, I like. I have some. I, I have something that ties in. Because I only wrote. I only wrote down stuff that I like. I, I, I told have you something. Guys I have a tie-in. I like. All right, I know, all right. but I like stuff. Go ahead. Uh, my tie-in to talking about Mary Jade is 
Luke Skywalker. Oh, come on. Yeah. That was my like clone craziness. Oh, so <laughs> it was a lot of clones. <laughs> I thought, okay, so when I read Air to the Empire, it's like, all right, they got a, a clone Jedi, they got Jorah Sabath, that's fine. And then by the end of that trilogy, there were so many clones. And Darth Vader just, how, okay. So in canon, Luke's lightsaber is just nowhere to be found, and we can just assume that his hand is gone forever. It fell into Atmo, and it's gone. Uh, but no, in the old EU, his hand and his lightsaber fell into a junk pile where Darth Vader picked them both up, took them to Mount whatever that I can't remember the name of right off the top of my head. Oh, Anybody? Yeah. The Emperor's right. Secret Facility. I can't remember yeah, what it was the, called. The place where Jorah Sabaoth clone was hanging out. Right. And uh, those those were just hanging out there waiting for you somehow... You think that story's way better than anything else we've gotten from Disney? Oh, well, <laughs> he grows the clone... And then I'm still hoping him. that the Luke we saw die on film is Luke, and that the real <laughs> Luke Skywalker is out there somewhere, not being a sad pussy. <laughs> Point taken. I just clone madness. Yeah, Too you're right. Many you're right. Clones. You're, but here's the other thing, though, about that is all of that stuff was written prior to the prequels, where all we knew about clones was Obi-Wan's mention of the Clone Wars. Your father was a pilot in the Clone Wars, and nobody had context for what this, what clones were in the galaxy of Star Wars. So, like, they were important. We gotta do something with them, because they exist. What are they? And I feel like, yeah, maybe it got a little silly, but at the same time, uh... You know, they, they got creative, they got weird, they they did stuff with clones in in the best Star Wars way they knew how at the time. I felt like Jorah Sabath was enough clone for me in that But how could there only context. be one clone? It goes against everything that means anything there could about be other clones. clones out there, but it's a big galaxy. Just just like everything in the in the entirety of Star Wars seems to happen around this one place. Mm-hmm. Tatooine is where everything happens, even though it's nowhere. So we gotta make all the thing about clones? We gotta make all the thing about this? They're clones. There are a lot of them. And they can all be out there doing things. We don't have to center around all of them. They don't have to all be involved in this one story. I, I think you're probably right. Never mind. <laughs> All right, I found something. Okay. I had a bunch of books roll through my head that I didn't like. I didn't like Lucina's Millennium Falcon book. The Black Fleet Crisis was really boring. The I think the original Han Solo trilogy was kind of lame. But I decided I'd, I'd pick one that pisses Dave off. Oh, no. I got real fucking tired of Karen Travis's Mandalorians. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I got so... By the time Boba Fett was like 85 years old and was a main character... In those books near the end, I was done with it. I felt like they beat that into the ground. Um, I, I just, I, I have no problem with Boba Fett. I have no problem with Mandalorians. Her depiction of them was fine. But I just thought they got to the point where Boba Fett, there was because there was that big storyline with Boba Fett and his daughter and his granddaughter and him and, and all this stuff. And I just, I don't know. I, I, it drove me nuts by the end here, of it. I just didn't care. Here is the degree to which I will agree with you. That stuff was, it lost its direction. It yeah. felt like it was going on just because they had already established Fett as this really, like they'd given the character depth. They'd made him cool, and they had made the idea of the Mandalorians cool, and then it's almost, it, it was almost like, a Dean Koontz book, only instead of providing a really <laughs> shitty, unsatisfying ending, he just kept writing? Yeah. Uh, yeah so I mean, I, I'm actually with you there. Like, they, it just went on way too long. Yeah, she, it was like she I didn't, didn't finish it. 
it was like she didn't know what to do once she had because the, you know uh man well, not man, it wasn't mandalore whatever their home planet was yeah it was called something else and they the empire seeded it with something that killed mandalorians and they're like and then yeah. he had to become the king of the mandalorians and then like once that happened everything after that was kind of bullshitty yeah it's just they just uh, and it and it goes hand in hand with another point real quick is that what, a problem I, I kind of had near the end was they were so afraid after killing Chewbacca they were so afraid to kill off anybody and every series that came up they would tease this is, is this going to be end of Luke Skywalker and then you get to the end of it nah everybody's fine yeah yeah like, it, it just got really old and like I wish that they would have had their chance like the new movies did to finish off those character stories. You know, well, uh, the, way a, the, way a, the way a hero... No, but a way a hero dies is part of their legend. Right? Uh, you know, King Arthur, you know, you know uh, Robin Hood shooting the arrow, whatever. But the legend's part of it is about how their story ends. And they never, outside of Chewie saving Anakin from a moon being pulled onto a planet, um, besides that, they, you know, and like they killed off Akbar and Mon Mothma and shit over time. But... They, they never touched the big three. And Boba Fett kind of became part of that big three. He kind of became a character that no matter how sick they made him, no matter how old they made him, he still managed to stay alive for the next book. Well, and that was the Ooh. problem, is they kind of, they kind of <laughs> turned him into Job almost. Like, they yeah, all yeah, yeah these, they did, right. They put him through yeah. all these insane trials, and there really wasn't any payoff to it. And, I, and I'm not saying he even needed to die, but like... It just didn't go anywhere, and honestly, that was part of the reason I was okay with Disney ejecting this, is that by the end, a lot of what was going on with the old EU is it felt like it was just kind of spinning its wheels. It felt like every series that started with the idea, okay, this is the time we're going to kill off Luke, and then they, they halfway through, they got cold feet. Like, it felt like that every time, because they killed off the children. But you're right. telling me Han Solo makes it to 85? Like, that, it, it... Good. Th- that kind of ties into my worst. Have y'all read The Crystal Star? No. I have, but I don't remember. Oof. The Crystal Star is the biggest bunch of bullshit <laughs> in Star Wars history. So in this book, Luke acts his bittiest by losing his Force powers when his son dies and then like mopes around and joins a cult led by a blob and they're cinetars and werewolves. <laughs> wow. I know I've read it. it's Va- Vonda something is the author. Yeah. McIntyre. Vonda yep. McIntyre. Vonda McIntyre. Yeah. I don't remember oh. it at all, but matter of fact, I think I have it upstairs in hardcover. Yeah, it's bad. Oh. Hey, speaking of books, I'd like this is a shout out to some of my friends in Georgia. Uh in the um, dark, in uh, Kevin J. Anderson's Jedi Academy trilogy, he started using the he started capitalizing things like Jedi robe, <laughs> like he would put on his. And we thought it was the funniest and dumbest thing we'd ever seen. He would just put Jedi in front of something and cap. But he would they would always he he doffed, he donned his Jedi robes and we just it, but it was caps and we always thought that was fucking hysterical and really stupid. That's great. I don't know if I ever even noticed that. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really stupid. I mean, I met Kevin. He was a nice guy, but it was just so dumb. Those books were not well written. But no, I I've us, read those books. Yeah, they give us Kip Duron. Um, uh, that's another thing, and this can be a, oh, a Kip Duron. That guy eventually got redeemed but what a jackass but but that's another thing too i I would say that um one of the the problems with the expanded universe but it's maybe hard to hold it against it considering how things have gone in disney is the the reliance on the super weapon yeah yeah it's constantly coming back to the bigger batter gun dark saber to whatever the was it sun crusher center sun crusher (laughs) center point station sun crusher yeah yeah all these big but, things, it, it, it always came down to, here's a big thing that can destroy a lot of things. And, but at least you know, the nature and, of these super weapons was different every time. Yeah. And I feel <laughs> like they all came from, from different origins. Like, it, they, they didn't feel like, oh, it's another Death Star. Mm-hmm. No, they weren't. It just became a very yeah, well yeah. used Oh, yeah, it got old. Yeah, uh, so that, that's one thing that kind of... Um, yeah, it really stands out to me. 
Um, all right, I've already mentioned the the, the, the death of Anakin Solo was too much. Uh, yeah. That was my big like thing I didn't like. But the the other thing that I had down here is the Killick. Oh, the the oh the Dark Nest trilogy. Yucko. Awful. Awful. I didn't like anything about it. I, I, I didn't like that it lingered on as the EU continued. So uh, fucking terrible. And, and I don't know... Honestly, I don't know that I really feel like the story was bad. I just... The idea of giant sentient bugs is so gross to me, and I apologize to any giant sentient bugs that might be in our audience today. Okay, this is the only ad hominem attack I'm going to make, but the reason that sucked is it was written by Troy Denning. And Troy Denning's Star Wars novels were bad. Sorry. What else did he write? Because I know that name. I know he wrote quite he a few. He wrote, um... God, I'm trying to remember, but I was never happy when his name came up. He huh. wrote several... Well, he wrote some New Jedi Order. New Jedi Order. He wrote some of the Fate of the, um... Uh, Fate of the uh, Jedi. Fate, Fate of the Jedi books. He wrote the Dark Nest trilogy. Um, he wrote Tatooine Ghost. He wrote a bunch of the Legacy of the Force books. He wrote Crucible. Um, yeah, so he, I just never... Uh, Tatooine Ghost was the one I really wanted to like, um, which was the one about Han and Leia um, right before Heir to the Empire, where they're um, uh, on Tatooine, and Leia's... It's, it's the first one, like, it came out after the prequels. So, in it... Leia is basically learning all about her mother by recordings from R2-D2. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't and it's bad. Really, oh, I hated that because I felt it was so clunky. Like, why does Leia need to know all this information? It, it, it felt, simply felt like, oh, we because have all this information Because there's a movie coming now. out. No, uh-huh. this was after the movies. Or because this the came movies out came out. we got to tie everything right. together. It was so awkward. But, uh, but yeah, the Darkness trilogy was not good. And you're right, like, forever Jason was still, like, part bug. Yeah, that was very off-putting. I didn't like anything I mean, about to, it. And, to, and Tahiri, right? His, his girlfriend. And I liked a Tahiri a lot. I liked Tahiri. Yeah, Tahiri was cool. Um, yeah. One thing yeah. I had on my list was the new Jedi Order, and I just listed a bunch of Jedi that I missed. Like the Sulasars <laughs> and Str- uh, uh, Streen. And Katar and Brackus and Siligal and Zek and Kip and the Suicide. Oh, Suicars. and the, um, the, the Lizard Jedi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't remember their names. I can't remember their world or anything. But the, the ones that were like, um, I was a female big lizard. She wasn't a Trandoshan. She was, uh, I don't remember, but I loved her. S- Sissing and laughter was often used. <laughs> oh yeah. See, I what I liked was that that um, you know not to go back to likes, but it, the the fact you know uh, the new movies give us a different vision of it. But this, but the 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 expanded universe gave us a vision of Luke actually creating a new generation of Jedi. Yes, who became forces in the galaxy, and sometimes it fell apart. Who were at odds with the Republic a lot. You know, there were a lot of stories where it was the head of the Republic was like, "Hey, do this," and Luke's yeah. like, "Fuck off. Yeah. It don't work for you." Well, and and there were leaders, and there were characters you cared about, who who lived and died, and and who you watched grow up and become more powerful, like uh, like Corrin Horn or Kyle Katarn, um, you know, or something. So I, I do miss that kind of actually having a generation, and, and of course with the with the solo children as well. I miss having that kind of generation of new Jedi. So we got to wrap it up, and I have one question mm-hmm. for everyone: mm-hmm. if you had to choose your your own personal canon for post return of the jedi would it be the old eu the good and the bad or would it be what disney has done oof for me old eu 100% don't even have to take a second to think about it because i want my luke and leia and han to remain heroes, to keep fighting, to live lives, to have some reward for fighting so hard, but also to keep doing it because that's who they are. Um, I don't like... Yeah. I, I, You know, there are things I love about what Disney has done, but going, and, going back and looking at the stories that were told in the old expanded universe, they're so much more satisfying to me. That's so tough. I'm, I'm going to agree, actually. 
I, I feel like Han's death was empty. Leia's death, I mean, it meant something. Luke's death meant something. But uh, there was so much more they could have done to... And I know we're in movies, and, and we only have so much time to pass the baton, as it were. But they they could have done more in the books to to help hand that off. And, and the books were not satisfying. It feels like Disney has people's hands tied a lot more than Lucasfilm did. And I know Lucasfilm gave people certain parameters, but I think the old EU had a lot more openness. It was way much more of a playground to just go nuts than Disney is. Okay. <laughs> this is a I, I know, like I'm thinking. <laughs> okay, here, here, here's the, the only the only caveat I'll give is this: is it feels a little apples to oranges, and only for this reason. In the current continuity skips basically thirty years, right? Like the what you're talking about, Han's death, Leia's death, that happens thirty years later. And the expanded universe, we got to see all of those years. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. One though, year at a time. One story at a time. Disney has told us basically what happened during those thirty years. Vaguely, but we haven't gotten stories. We haven't gotten a ton of stories. We're getting, starting to get a few. Um, their their new favorite era seems to be the time between Endor and uh, uh, what's that place called? Where Ray's from? That's completely. Jakku. Jakku, like between the Battle of Endor and the Battle of Jakku, is kind of where they're putting a lot of stories in right now. Um, but uh, I, God, it's tough. I mean, I don't. I like. A, I still like. I I still like the sequel trilogy. Um, it's uh, it's different. <laughs> um, uh, I would have to say the expanded universe only because if it's the expanded universe, then I know a lot more. Because most of my shit in my head is expanded universe. <laughs> So I'd be back to being like a Star Wars trivia master <laughs> if we went back to the expanded universe. Um, uh, so I would probably take it, but I, I, but the only thing that keeps me from that is I do like Han's death. I do like some of the things. I do like Ben Solo, and it, like we got to. I don't like where the expanded universe ended up. I do not like those last few years of books. I don't like where the characters were by the time Disney came in. Um, I thought it was getting real boring, and it wasn't it wasn't fun anymore. So uh, you know, I I agree with you on. That. I would take the first, I would take the first like fifteen years after Return of the Jedi of the expanded universe. You know, like I would take that that good golden era, but I don't like the late period of it. Saba Saba time. That's right, Saba. The, bear- the bearables. Yeah, yeah. The barables, yeah, she was cool. whichever. Huh? She was cool. Bearables. Yeah, she was cool. Ryan, come on. I know, I'm thinking. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think like Chad said, it's it's too early to tell right now. And I think once High Republic comes out, I'll be very curious to see what happens with that. Well, now, I'm just talking about post, post-Jedi. Post-Jedi? Post-Jedi story. The story post-Jedi as opposed to... Right, right. Yeah. All right. So what I'll pose for that is one name. <laughs> Dave Filoni. Dash Rendar. Oh. <laughs> well, Dave think... Filoni hasn't created anything post Jedi yet. <laughs> but, um, but how can how can you? Man- how well, can not you created, comment? but Mandalorian. Mandalorian. He, he writes and directs on the Mandalorian. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right, Mandalorian. Yeah, and it's funny because I don't think of Mandalorian's almost its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. For me, and and maybe this is because you know I've read so much EU and been around him so much. I'm ready to move away from the Skywalkers and the Solos. Um, and I like that Disney canon is doing that. Um, do I think what they've done so far is better? No. But I think the potential is there. Um, and so I am hopeful that with things moving forward, like you know the rumored shows and the new books that are going to come out, that they'll get there, possibly. So I am cautiously optimistic i'm still not reading aftermath (laughs) it's awesome never (laughs) never know the pain of snap wexley's death oh man i i i got to know snap wexley plenty in the books i've already read (laughs) i didn't know he he died in one of those books i might read it just to experience that oh 
No. He dies in Rise of Skywalker. Oh, yeah. Got- it happened in the movie too. That, that's his like. Uh, that's his big moment. That's yes, that's his big moment. <laughs> Very sad. When did yeah, yeah? When does he die? I don't even remember. In, in the big battle at the end at Exegol. Yeah, yeah, right before the fleet shows up. That's when Poe's really down. Oh. Are they going to show up? And then, his, and then his stepdad shows up, and you're like, ah, oh, you just missed him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just missed him. Damn it, he was right here. He just missed him, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Well, guys. For all, for all that you love Wedge, you get two seconds in a movie. Yeah. You know what? He didn't want to do it in the first fucking place, so I'll take two seconds. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. He was asked to be in the first, in, in Force Awakens, and didn't want to do it, so. Well, in retrospect, I don't blame him. I'm just kidding. I like a lot of things about two-thirds of the new movies. You guys, thank you for coming out today and talking about the Star Wars legends, the old expanded universe. Before we go, uh, all three of you basically come from the same place. Uh, when, Where can we find your episodes and what is the name of your show? You could do it this, Beth. Oh, we, <laughs> we're all from the same place. We yes. are Execute Chapter 66, and you can find us on NeedlessThingsPodcast.com. And there is uh, no DragonCon app this year, so you can't give us a rating. But what you can do is share this episode, uh, hashtag DragonCon2020 on it. Let people know that there is a panel out there that very well could have taken place at DragonCon this year. So uh, thank you for listening and participating. And please follow Needless Things everywhere on the social media. And please comment your favorite Plu Coon memory. <laughs> and I don't know when this is coming out, but I'm pretty sure it's still going to be relevant. Wear your fucking mask. Yes. Especially if it's... Sadly, don't... it'll still be relevant. What if, what if we all had a Plu Coon mask to wear? Oh, That guy wears uh, a mask, right? Solved. That, that's because he's a trendsetter and was already all about safety. He is the coolest. <laughs> the Plu Cooniest. <laughs> And please remember, if you enjoyed this panel, there is no Dragon Con app this year. Or maybe there will be, I don't know, but this probably won't be in it. But instead of giving us five stars, you can give us five shares. Share this wherever you share Dragon Con things. Let your friends know, hey, here is basically a Dragon Con panel that you can just beam directly into your ears while you're driving around, while you're at the gym. Or, as I said, set yourself up in a big empty room, uh, put your media device on the table in front of you, uh, drink a bunch of beers, and enjoy our conversation about the history of Star Wars Expanded Universe. Oh, you guys, I, I... even though there's not a Dragon Con, and every time I say that, it, it stabs me in the heart a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to mention right now, because I'm not going to remember, I got a new soap that smells exactly like the Hilton soap, so it's wonderful and heartbreaking at the same time. Uh, but uh, I still have excitement based around the things that people are putting together in place of Dragon Con, and no, nothing will ever equal being in that environment being with our people but uh, like as with everything we have to do the best we can with what we have and I look around and I see people doing that from puppetry to science fiction to to performances to to everything that you would have at Dragon Con people are still making that stuff so if you if you invest yourself and you get involved and, and you look around there are ways to still have that magic and that energy and like I said, just think about what next year is going to be like. It's it's going to be amazing. It, 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 we'll, we'll look back on this blemish and, and realize that it just made us appreciate things even more. I love you guys. Thank you for listening to the Needless Things Podcast. You're the best. You can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Downcast, or in the ears of a Trader Vicks employee. Love you. Mean it. Uh-huh.